Thank you so much for joining us for the 32nd episode of the Clemens Bookworm. I'm Angela Unk, Director of Development at the Clemens Library. Just in case you're joining us for the first time, or if you need a reminder about how we use Zoom during this program, we do encourage you to use the chat function. We love for you to chime in. If you can take a moment to change your setting to all panelists and attendees, that allows everyone to participate in the conversation. If you have questions for our panelists today, please use the Q&A section. Uh, that keeps the questions all together. And you can also give a thumbs up to questions that you might have that someone else has asked. And that upvotes those questions so that they're higher up in the queue. We also have, whoops, I'm so sorry. We also have our uh, live machine captioning turned on today. If you go to the um, live transcription icon, you can change the size of the um, transcription or you can toggle it on or off as you need. I can only control so much of what you see, but I do have side-by-side -side mode enabled. So this should allow you to see both the slides and the speaker. You can move the separator between the two so that you get a good proportion that fits the device that you're using. This program is brought to you by the William L. Clemens Library located on the campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. The Clements Library enables the discovery, learning, and teaching of American history through the collection, conservation, digitization, and availability of primary sources on paper. Okay, we're going to close the opening poll. Whoops except I have the wrong slide up for that. So I'm just going to skip it and end the polling and share the results. Um, so the uh, question today is what does Juneteenth celebrate? And many of you uh, got the right answer. The news of the end of the Civil War reaching Galveston, Texas. And um, I know we had a little bit of discussion beforehand and maybe, I don't know, Crystal, if you want to, to mention um, what we were talking about. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so this is a topic of much discussion right now. And it's a kind of tricky um, historical event and moment. And we'll be talking a lot about freedom today and how we can kind of complicate ideas of freedom. But what we were talking about is the significance of it being the news of the Civil War ending reaching Galveston, Texas, and not the news of the Emancipation Proclamation, because the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation, as it was composed, didn't actually technically free people um, in the South, because it was up to enslavers to enforce that, which of course they did not, because they were rebelling, which is why the Civil War was going on. So it really took the end of the Civil War and then that gap between when the end of the Civil War occurred and then that news reaching Galveston, Texas. Thank you, thanks. So um, it, I'm sure that with all of the news, people uh, realize that Juneteenth is, um, uh, has, just this week, um, the United States Congress has passed legislation to establish a new federal holiday, Juneteenth National Independence Day. So that's really exciting news. And um, hopefully people will learn a little more today and will be inspired to continue that learning. Just end this. Today's episode of The Bookworm is generous, generously sponsored by an anonymous Clement supporter. Uh, thank you so much for your um, belief in this program and your belief in the Clements Library, and uh, we thank you very much. 
I am joined today by the Randolph G. Adams Director of the Clements Library, Paul Erickson, who will chat with author Crystal Lynn Webster about her new book, Beyond the Boundaries of Childhood, African American Children in the Antebellum North. So I'll turn it over to you, Paul. Great. Thanks so much, Angela. And thanks to uh, Ann and Tracy for um, uh, answering questions in the chat as we go along. Um, uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Crystal Webster this morning, who is joining us <coughs> shortly after 7 a.m. local time uh, in Vancouver. Um, Crystal is a historian of race, gender, and childhood, and she is currently an assistant professor of history at the University of British Columbia. Uh, Crystal received her PhD from the W.E.B. Du Bois Department of Afro-American Studies at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Uh, her dissertation uh, received awards from the National Council for Black Studies and the Association of Black Women Historians. Uh, today, we're gonna to be hearing about her first book, um, Beyond the Boundaries of Childhood, African-American Children in the Antebellum North, which is newly published from the University of North Carolina Press, um, as in available like two weeks ago, I think, right? Um, so very newly published. Uh, she recently completed a research fellowship uh, at Yale's Gilder Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition for her next book, which is titled Criminalizing Freedom, African Americans and the Making of Criminal Reform in Early America. Her writing has uh, has appeared in the Washington Post, the New York Times, and USA Today, among others. Um, and I have known Crystal since she was a participant in um, a summer seminar at the American Antiquarian Society, uh, where I used to work um, in 2015, called Reading Children. It was led by Pat Crane from New York University. And one of the great joys of my life in this business is um, sort of seeing projects come out um, uh, that I sort of got to hear about in their very early stages. And so it's really exciting um, to have Crystal here today to learn about her new book. So take it away. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. It's really such a pleasure to be here, especially on the day before Juneteenth. So I'm joining you all from Vancouver, British Columbia. I'm really grateful to be a guest on this land. And I wanna take a moment to acknowledge that I'm coming to you virtually from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Muskeen people. So today I really want to hold the meaning of Juneteenth as a guide to our conversation. And as we know and have been already talking about, Juneteenth is a holiday based on the concept and the experiences of delays of freedom and um, the delays of the news of the end of the Civil War. Beyond the Boundaries of Childhood is also a book which is much about the limitations of freedom delayed and unfulfilled, although it takes place in the antebellum North. And many scholars of African-American history and of um, history in the North and um, studies of slavery look at this theme, how there was not a single experience of bondage and how freedom was not immediate and universal. And they do so from different ways, either from geographic focuses on where people are living, from um, social limitations on freedom, and then really significantly for myself, gendered limitations on freedom, what women's experiences, Black women's experiences in slavery were like. And Beyond the Boundaries of Childhood takes up um, this scholarship and then does so from the perspective of Black children. And these are children whose age limited their access to freedom. The book is a social history of the transition from slavery to freedom, but really focusing again on the perspective and the experiences of Black children. And I do this by looking at their play, their institutionalization, their labor, their schooling, and their relationship to adults around them, mainly their parents and family members. The book is situated in the antebellum North precisely because of this very fraught and complicated transition from slavery to freedom in the region. So I wanna just take a moment to kind of explain that process because um, very similar to our discussion of Juneteenth, it is a, it's a complicated process. So there were a couple different versions of emancipation in the North. The most common was gradual emancipation and Pennsylvania was the first state to begin this process of gradual emancipation 
and did so in 1780. <clears throat> the law freed um, in Pennsylvania, freed children born of enslaved parents, but only after they reached age 28. So other states then began emancipating their, their enslaved populations in a very similar way. Rhode Island and Connecticut did so in 1784 and allowed emancipation of enslaved people once they reached age 25. New York gradually emancipated its enslaved population when people reached 25 and 28, and that was a gendered distinction. And New Jersey also did so in 1804, using ages 21 for women and 25 for men as the marker to emancipation. Of this region, Massachusetts was the only state to issue full emancipation, and this was after freedom suits brought by African-Americans themselves, and they did so in 1783. But in all of these regions, what my book is really interested in exploring is what does this look like for Black children who had to age into freedom? And the way that this process worked was that once children were born after these dates, they were kind of in this in-between status as indentured servants, but often fulfilling very similar roles as enslaved people. So for all of these reasons, emancipation in the North was largely based on age and black children had to grow up in order to be free. They were subjected to new forms of unfreedom based on being black, being children and being indentured. And as a result, they were suspended between slavery and freedom, not quite either, but also suspended between the new categories and legal categories of being a child and being an adult and not quite either at the same time. So this really interesting paradox that I explore in the book. So today I'm going to focus on this theme of unfulfilled freedom by sharing stories from a few of the children in my book. And they really illustrate this best um, by looking at the tensions between work and play and how this tension limited freedom for Black children. So I'm going to talk today about some children in the book named Rachel, Zilpha, and Stephen. And each of these children show up at different points um, and really represent this, um, this unfulfilled freedom. So I look at these children by examining how not only they're um, marginalized through this process, but that they resist the restrictions on their play and the commodification of their labor. And that this resistance, I argue, was a form of freedom making. They made their own freedom in this context of being um, unfree Black children in the North. So I'm going to begin by talking about Rachel. In the mid 19th century, children of an elite white Pennsylvania family, the Morris family, enjoyed a summer of play and adventure. And this is really beautifully preserved in this sketch of the Morris family, um, a sketch of children who are playing, climbing trees, um, playing games, frolicking in the fields, riding horses, um, and just having a wonderful outdoor playful summer um, with friends and family. This sketch was done by one of the Morris children and it beautifully represents and encapsulates their lives as children, but also this important moment in the history of childhood during the 19th century. This is an era in which norms for children transitioned away from viewing children as kind of little adults. And these are earlier kind of Puritan views of children um, that argued that children ought to work, that there was no problem with children working, they could be full of sin, 
um, really different treatment of children. Um, transitioning to the 19th century, especially by this point, um, in which modern ideas of children viewed them as innocent beings who should be protected by the adults around them, who should be free to go to school, to play, like the Morris children here, um, and to have an enjoyable childhood, childhood as a distinct um, de developmental stage and kind of cultural um, norm. And with these changes in treatment of children, this protected um, children like the Morris children, predominantly white elite children, and especially their play. Um, there was theorizations around children's play as an important part of childhood development. But at this exact moment, black children in the North were still enslaved and indentured and certainly black children in the South, as we've been talking about, the Civil War is not yet over, the 13th Amendment is not here, black children are still enslaved. So this shift in ideas of childhood intervened on black children's access to dominant treatment of children and concepts of childhood. So if black children played, they were still seen as um, resisting labor, as being deviant, as um, maybe too mature to play, but at the same time, too childish to behave. Um, and at the same time, naturally suited for labor. So again, these kind of paradoxes that Black children experience. So they did not experience a freedom to play, but at the same time, they carved out spaces for leisure and enjoyment as children. And in doing so, they imagined possibilities for themselves beyond racialized notions of childhood as well as limitations on their freedom. So as I say, I argue that for black children in the North, play was a contested site of freedom making. And for no one was this clearer than for Rachel. Rachel is on the cover of my book and she really stands out amongst the sea of children preserved in the sketchbook. She, I discovered her in a drawing titled Playing Blind Man's Bluff. And in this drawing, the blindfolded Hannah, a child in the Morris family, and Luke, her little brother, play with Rachel and Hannah tugs on Rachel's apron as if she's just been caught. Rachel was most likely indentured to the Morris family as a young girl. And the other children, Hannah, Luke, even the pets, are well documented in the Morris family papers but Rachel is not. Really what we know about the family and um, what we can find in their records tells us about Rachel, um, despite her absence in the Morris family papers. The family was involved in Quaker activism in the Philadelphia region. And that includes their work at the Philadelphia Shelter for Colored Orphans, which was the first orphanage to admit Black children, and it did so in 1822. Rachel's presence at the Morris family home may have been a direct effect on their involvement. They may have, from their relationship from growing up with Rachel, decided to become um, activists at the Philadelphia Shelter for Colored Orphans, or perhaps um, it went the opposite. Perhaps they had Rachel indentured from the Philadelphia for Colored Orphans. We're not really sure um, which direction that goes. But again, but despite the very limited knowledge we have of Rachel, she tells us so much about Northern Black childhood. Rachel found ways to carve out space for play, blind man's bluff while she worked at the same time. And this was a typical experience for black children who were indentured. They were indentured in domestic homes. They lived in the home, they grew up with children. Um, and that, that distinction between work and play was very much blurred for them 
but what was play like for an indentured child? Did this play bring the same joy and freedom it did the Morris children? Rachel's words were not recorded by the Morris family. She only has this kind of sly smile as she plays. But again, this was, um, this was documented by one of the children. But the fact that she did play while working is, is very radical. She found space for leisure, leisure in, a, in a place and a setting that sought to commodify her labor. Playing during work infringed on that commodification. Other indentured children tell us in their own words about their complicated relationships to play in the North. And one of those children is Zilpha Ewa. As a young girl, Zilpha was also indentured to a Quaker family when she was 12 years old. And she described that experience as, again, very complicated. When she played with the children to whom she was indentured, she felt sinful, she felt childish, she felt immature, and she believed that religious instruction was her only way of relief that didn't kind of make her internalize um, something wrong with her, essentially. Time and time again, Northern Black children and their childhood and youth was represented by adults without mention of play or by overemphasizing their mature dispositions like Zilpha Ewa. And Rachel, although she was represented in this sketchbook, doesn't tell us more about her story. Um, and as I said, the Morris family left out any mention of her. And this marginalization and erasure has then the effect of marginalizing black children and their play um, in ways that justify their mistreatment. So not, not allowing black children to have that space or not celebrating that or um, writing about it in ways that um, they were doing something wrong justified um, the indenture of black children and the, the process of the end of emancipation in the North. Beyond play, Northern Black children experience various other forms of paradoxes and limitations on freedom. And one of these were the tensions between protection or care and paternalistic intervention and harm. This harm often occurred inside institutions that were led by reformers who were involved in um, assisting the African-American community during this transition from slavery to freedom. Um, and many of these were Quakers in Pennsylvania. Stephen Ricks was one of the first children admitted to the Philadelphia Sheltered for Colored Orphans, the same institution that the Morris family was involved in. From the moment he arrived at the orphanage, the administrators and teachers were greatly affected by Stephen. He was incredibly intelligent and they described how he could draw a map of the United States entirely from memory. And he was only six years old. Stephen composed a beautiful poem for his friend, Mary. And this poem I include in the prologue of my book um, was so moving that it was published in the anti-slavery juvenile periodical, The Slave Friend. Stephen died tragically only one and a half years after entering the orphanage. And he was one of many children who died at very disproportionate numbers to um, white children at other sorts of orphanages. And he died due to the spread of disease um, and illness inside very confined spaces, as well as substandard medical care, or rather, these factors um, had an important impact on his life. The administrators described his death and his life, um, again, in a kind of mature way by emphasizing how Stephen faced death without fear and favored retirement in pen with book over playing outside. Stephen and many other children at the orphanage were not orphans. 
Most had a living relative, often a mother, and sometimes these relatives attempted to use these orphanages as sites of temporary care while they, while they themselves transitioned from slavery to freedom. In this way, Northern Black orphanages like the Philadelphia Shelter provided protection, but at the same time, tragically, these institutions were also sites of confinement, family separation, pathologization, and racial violence. Many orphanages, including Philadelphia Shelter and quite famously, New York, the New York Colored Orphanage, were victims of racist mobs who attacked the children and the buildings during events of racial terror. And notably, Stephen Rick, as I mentioned, died just one year and a half after entering the orphan. Black children in these spaces were cared for by adults who were engaged in larger social and political movements. And for this reason, their autonomy and their own family's desires were often ignored by this concept of the greater good. They lived on as kind of symbols of respectability, reform, and Black progress. Adults placed limitations on Black children like Stephen, and in doing so limited their access to freedom. The representations of Stephen and justifications for our memorial, rather his memorialization, also served as a justification for um, putting them in these institutions, even when for some they could be harmful and even deadly. Orphanages, juvenile reformatories, and schools all indentured African-American children during this period. And they did so even after the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment. Indentures were viewed as a form of um, a necessary element of assimilation and Black progress and a way for Black children to prove themselves as productive members of society. But these indentures did not actually promote um, economic mobility um, because many of them were indentured to rural settings and unskilled domestic labor, while at the same time, white children who were apprenticed or indentured were performing more skilled labor, which allowed them a kind of seamless transition from childhood to adulthood, um, gaining. Um, a skill in the economic sphere. The indenturing of black children complicates associations between the work of reformers and anti-slavery activists and the promise of black freedom, mainly because abolitionist societies were very heavily involved in the indenture of black children. They balanced their mission of securing education and jobs for newly freed um, black population with the needs of employers um, and former enslavers often in their own communities. While looking through the attendance records of a school run by the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society, I was really surprised to find records of requests for indentured labor. And what really stood out to me was that many of these requests mirrored advertisements for enslaved labor in the South. Many of these requests exotified, objectified, and commodified, as well as sexualized the school children while they were requesting assistance for labor. <clears throat> for example, um, Sather Waite wrote or was recorded by the Abolitionist Society to request three lovely looking boys and in the end, the school supplied two. The vast majority of these inquiries were for young female domestics around the ages of 13 or 14, or quote, half grown, 
And at times they were very specific about the types of features and attributes that they desired for the children. John Lyburn requested a quote, good girl for general housekeeping. And Thomas Harvey requested two children to accompany a mother. And here, the one that I've chosen to show and share with you all today, a Miss English requests a girl from 12 years of age who's agreeable looking, not very dark, and wanted as soon as possible. Black children who were light-skinned were frequently requested. And this preference for skin tone represented an adherence to the racial hierarchies of the South and that also existed in the North and that show a, a preference um, and a kind of um, emerging um, hierarchy based on skin tone as a um, proximity to whiteness. The school wrote supplies next to an inquiry when they were able to procure an indenture for that child and their future employer. Yet the placement of these requests inside this attendance book was very jarring. Um, and to me indicates that the recorder likely referenced the school record, who is at the school, who's coming to the school, um, what the children's names are, kind of flipping back and forth um, to meet the needs of potential employers. And this blurs the lines between black children's schooling and their work. So even at their, even while they're at this abolitionist school, um, attempting to gain an education um, to kind of advance themselves in society, they're still being commodified and objectified um, and their labor, they're seen as potential laborers, even just as children. So while I looked through these numerous inquiries, I realized that the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society was contributing to Black children's adventure um, and to sending these children in significant numbers often to other Quaker communities, like where Rachel and Zilpha ended up. So they were simultaneously fighting for the end of slavery while they were indenturing Black children. And in this way, these children's experiences really change how we categorize or categorize abolitionist society's roles in the end of slavery, but also in their kind of tension with how they see that and occurring, which is really on the backs of Black children. So in all of this, Rachel, Zilpha, and Stephen, as well as the children at the Clarkson School run by the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society, experienced limitations in all aspects of their life while they were playing, while they were in school, as laborers in their health, and as separated from their parents. Although gradual emancipation offered them a path to freedom, they could never experience its full benefits until adulthood. And some children, like Stephen, never grew up because of these very limitations. Nevertheless, they took up space as children and asserted their own needs and desires, and in doing so, redefined social norms, ideas of um, African Americans, and ideas of children. They found furtive, they found freedom in furtive spaces and in fugitive acts. Zilpha, Rachel, and Stephen all challenged the boundaries of childhood. So thank you very much. And I really look forward to our discussion and the Q&A. Thank you so much, Crystal. This is really fantastic. Um, so I have a few questions for you. Um, and then we will open things up to Q&A from our audience. Um, and as we talked about uh, before we started, today's program is, is um, uh, meant to mark Juneteenth, um, which is officially tomorrow, which is a day that is about the delay and the continued refusal of freedom, just as much as it is about this sort of moment of emancipation, um, you know, given that it marks, um, what it marks is 
news reaching people too late. Um, uh, you know, in this case, several months after um, the war, the war had ended. Um, and there was a really striking line in in your book. Um, uh, you, you write that many African Americans during this period conceptualized freedom as family, um, and that's it's incredibly moving throughout the book. The way that um, all of the stories you tell are about not just the delayed um, the delay of full freedom, but also the delay in the forestalling of families being reunited, and that's sort of something that. Um, that is just really moving and hangs over the entire book. And so I really encourage people to, to buy the book and, and read it if, you, if, um, if it's of interest, which it should be. So this is a question I ask everybody who um, uh, is on the bookworm since we are a library and we love things that happen in libraries and stories about libraries. How did you come to this project? Was there a moment um, when you were doing research when you realized that this was what you wanted to write about? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that there are a couple ways um, that I kind of identify how I came to this project. And one of the important ways is kind of recognizing the, um, the legacy and the significance of historiography, particularly in Black women's history and in the history of childhood and youth. Um, and I think we'll want to talk more today about um, the kind of trajectory of this. But for me, it was so important to recognize um, Black women historians, particularly Erica Armstrong Dunbar, Leslie Alexander, who really kind of set the stage for works that look at these spaces. And again, look at that kind of fraught experience for African-American women um, in the antebellum North. And then, from that kind of background, um, looking at Black children became so important um, through the works of um, Wilma King and Stolen Childhood, as well as, um, again, studies of the history of childhood and youth, Anna Mae Duane and Robin Bernstein. And so I was really interested in this question of um, what does it mean to be a child in the North and to look at that from a child perspective. Um, and really went searching in the archive anywhere I could find um, Black children. And as I mentioned, they came in unexpected places. And one of the first children that um, really struck me and kind of led the project in the way that it went was Rachel. Um, kind of originally looking at doing a broader history of some of these institutions and um, experiences in the North. So looking through the Morris family because of their relationship to um, Northern institutions for black children, but then finding Rachel there was so um, such an important and compelling moment for me in the archive and really kind of um, got me back to, got me grounded in really looking for black children and focusing from their perspective, doing a kind of child um, centered history, which is really tricky, right? Because um, I'm an adult <laughs> writing about children um, and also because um, black children in the archive, it's a kind of broad um, space. So I think that that, um, that moment was so significant for me. Um, not only finding Rachel, but realizing that I was going to need to look in all these different ways um, through the archive to kind of locate the stories that I was interested in telling. Um, and yeah, and really trying to um, draw upon those new histories and historiography, historiographical work that was focusing on the antebellum North, focusing on women and um, challenging the ways that we think about slavery um, geographically and the kind of gendered um, experiences of slavery. Um, so how do you define childhood for the context of, uh, for the purpose of the uh, purposes of this project, given that childhood was a category that, as you talked about, was really in flux uh, in the period that you're studying here. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, things that we now sort of think of as Relating to specific phases of life, um, you know, adolescence, and uh, you know these were these were new concepts um, uh, in the in the early nineteenth century, and in particular, 
what does it mean in this period to be a free child, given that part of how childhood is defined is that you, is negatively, right? That you don't have full legal rights. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I really love this question because I think it gets that the um, dilemma that I was facing um, when writing about children, when writing about black children that I um, really work through with the book, but kind of resist a single definition of childhood be precisely because of those reasons. Um, and what I really want to bring out in this book was that there is not a universal experience of childhood, but also not a universally applied definition of childhood, right? So we have all these interesting um, kind of legal categories for who is a child, social categories for who is a child, and then um, gendered categories, right? And that these are in tension with one another, not just for black children, but for um, non-elite children, for non-white children. Um, again, all of these kind of complicated, <clears throat> excuse me, experiences of childhood. So for myself, I at first was really interested in who was being, um, who was being identified as a child, but again, for the Black experience um, in the antebellum era, many times adults, or what we would consider to be adults, um, were being identified as children. Adults were being infantilized at the same time that Black children were being adultified. So again, this really tricky paradox. Um, so for example, um, some of the children that I look at, um, or even if we just kind of think legally, about gradual emancipation. It's intended to be until children reach adulthood. And then in some places, as I mentioned, this is age 28. So does that mean that black children are children until age 28? Um, or if we're thinking um, from like a criminal, criminal justice standpoint, we have at the same time that juvenile reformatories are being established and admitting white children to pull them out of adult prisons or to put them in a separate space to kind of protect their childhood and protect the idea that children um, don't know the same things that adults know when they commit crimes. While that's happening, black children are still being sent to adult prisons. So we have that very clear um, different definition of who is a child in those kind of legal treatments of children in those two examples. Um, but so for myself, I kind of tried to move through all these different um, tensions and paradoxes by really just centering the individual children in the study. And I tried to do this also watching them grow up a bit. So some of the children um, kind of go in and out of these different spaces. So they might have been um, indentured at one stage space, um, criminalized in another space, going to school in another space, and kind of recognize how they were defined by adults around them in each of these spaces, but also then what they are doing for themselves and how they're attempting to kind of make themselves visible as individuals resisting this, um, this um, kind of racist treatment from the adults around them. So the, the the short of it is that I tried to be um, a little bit more specific with each individual child and also that um, I at the same time resisted a kind of single definition of childhood for that specific reason. And as a historian, it's also so important for me to be historically specific, right? To think about childhood, as you said, in flux and changing over time. So the children, in the 19th century or in the early 19th century and how that was defined changes by the time we get to the mid and late 19th century. Right. Um, and it's, I, you know, as I was reading the book, I was struck by ways in which this conflation of unfreedom and childhood is still with us, right? So the category of emancipated minor is a legal category, um, you know, uh, where a child that it petitions can be treated as an adult, but framing it in the language of emancipation is, is very strange. Um, so 
you know, there's been a, a great shift in scholarship over the last um, 10, uh, 10, 15 years or so to, you know, considering intersectionality seriously, um, sort of the ways that um, that race and gender and class um, uh, and physical ability all come together to, to affect people's experiences in history. Why has it taken so long for age to be um, taken into consideration in, in that conversation? Yeah, this is a really, really excellent question. I think that we, in some ways, are kind of poised to do this because of, um, as I mentioned, the foundational work in some of these areas, especially in childhood studies, as well as the history of childhood and youth scholars who have really said, okay, we, we really need to look at age. This is an important category. And I think it's, it's taken a little while. I think I've, I've been thinking about this a little bit, um, especially in my approach to the archive. Um, I think because of um, adult assumptions about children, which really essentially come from this um, shift in um, ideas of childhood or have roots in these shifts in ideas of childhood in the 19th century. Um, these adult assumptions, which mainly are, some scholars define it or define it or describe it as childism, um, marginalizing the wants, desires, the agency of children themselves and really treating them only as dependents of the adults around them as not historically significant, as not um, having historical um, agency. And I think um, because of this wave, this important wave of um, scholarship that really challenges that, um, we've done, we're beginning and are kind of in the the midst of doing the work to look at age as a category of analysis. And then based on that foundation can now do the very complicated work of looking at age and race at the same time, or of looking at age, race, and gender. And I'm, in, in that I'm thinking about the important um, scholarship on black girlhood studies and that being such a, um, significant moment right now that we're able to kind of build upon um, the simultaneous categories and look at the experiences of black girls, which tell us so much about um, different historical moments and different social um, and economic forces. For myself, um, the experiences of black girls, uh, I think is probably most clearly represented through figures like Rachel and Zilpha, like I talked like today, talked about today, um, and then has played such an important role in my next project. I look at Black girls criminalization and discover that very harsh treatments against Black girls really defined um, early American um, criminal, re criminal reform, which was such a surprise to me. But again, because of that work that says we need to look at these categories at the same time, I'm able to, to gain so many more, so many new insights on um, the criminal reform period in early America. Fantastic. And you, you know, you've mentioned this great wave of scholarship um, that's happening right now on 19th century childhood and especially on 19th century black childhood. And um, for people in the audience who are interested, um, you know, work by scholars like Anna Mae Duane and Nazara Wright and Robin Bernstein, Rick Bell, Bridget Fielder, um, Karen Woods Weirman. There's just this sort of great, um, uh, great moment happening right now in the study of 19th century childhood. Um, you you mentioned in the book you use this phrase finding black children in unexpected places. And for a lot of uh, folks in our audience who are connected with the University of Michigan, that will um, remind them of Phil Deloria's book Finding Indians in Unexpected Places. Um, so I want to I want to push on this idea of unexpected a little bit, right? So why are we surprised when there are Indians or black children in the archive? Um, is, it, is it an actual issue with the archive itself that, they're, that um, those figures are very rare and hard to find? Or is it a problem with how we've been taught to think about what the archive and what's, what's there and what's not? Yeah, that's such a fantastic question too. And so I think beyond what um, scholars have done to kind of challenge um, our assumptions of the archive and the construction of the archive. So um, 
I'm thinking about Sia Hartman and Marisa Fuentes um, and how um, the archive is kind of a, a fraught and marginalized space. I think thinking beyond that, looking at black children for myself, um, I discovered that um, much like other um, ways the black experience is represented, that black children are not just in the world that we imagine children should be in. Um, and the way that I approached this was, or the way that I described this was almost kind of playing with the archive. So really imagining the world of a child and, and coming to terms with the fact that children are not um, in these discrete spaces, right? Children are not just in school. Children are not just in um, or on the playground, that they move in and out of these spaces, that this concept of like seen and not heard um, exists in the archive too, that even though the adults around them um, may have been treating them as, as these kind of dependents who need to be in these certain places that they weren't, right? They moved in and out of all spaces of life. So like for the Morris family who are um, in most of their um, records, um, describing their their day-to-day -day lives, their financial situations, um, uh, corresponding with one another that Rachel is just there because she's a child and she's in all of these spaces. So um, other examples of that might be um, how um, children in my book, um, uh, children like, like Stephen, I, I loved how Stephen showed up in all these different spaces. He's in um, this juvenile periodical. He's in the house, um, the orphanage institutional records. And then he's in private correspondence. He's in all of these spaces because he's a child who goes in and out of these, these spaces. And also children have a kind of, especially black children have a kind of unique access to these spaces, right? Because um, black children were working, they're, they're doing work around white adults, they're with white adults, they're with white children, but they're also with black children. Um, they're um, in many of these institutions, but they're also, um, yeah, entering in and out of spaces that maybe black adults couldn't go to. They have a kind of unique access. Um, and other scholars write about this during slavery, how black children can kind of hear and and see things, or even in the Middle Passage, have access to spaces that adults don't have. So they have that kind of unique ability to move around um, in ways that take a little bit of play and imagination to really get at, to, to kind of think in, in the mind and through the eyes of a child. Um, I have so many more questions. There, this is so fascinating to think about from the perspective of sources and research, but I know that we have uh, questions from the audience. So I will turn things over to Angela, who is going to um, make a couple announcements and then um, uh, ask some of those questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Crystal. Um, this is so great. And I do see all of the wonderful questions. And so I'll just make these brief announcements. Our next bookworm is on July 16th and it's an author conversation with Karen Marrero uh, discussing her book, Detroit's Hidden Channels, The Power of French Indigenous Families in the 18th Century. So since you are already registered for the bookworm, you will receive a reminder about upcoming sessions. And if you are unable to attend live, you will still receive the email with the link and the recording and resources. Um, in fact, today we will send a follow-up email this afternoon with uh, any resources mentioned today and a link to the recording. And you can also view previous recordings on our website. I just want to thank everybody for participating in the bookworm. It really means a lot to us to have your participation um, and to have that community of um, 
you know, seeking, seeking further knowledge. We also, of course, really appreciate any financial support that you might be able to give. And today's uh, bookworm episode was sponsored by um, an anonymous supporter of the Clemens Library. Uh, and we certainly appreciate that. You can contact uh, myself or Anne Bennington Helber if you have any interest in sponsoring a future episode of The Bookworm. Okay, and without further ado, we'll get to some of these questions. Um, Elizabeth is wondering what happened to the indentured children when they reached maturity? Would the families keep them on as paid servants or were they turned out and were they replaced by other indentured children? That's such a great question. Um, it varied. So for many of the children I was looking at in the cities, I was looking at the institutions indentured them away from the city often to rural family or rural settings. Um, and then sometimes in the city as domestic. So many of the records that I shared today um, were asking for domestic. So in the cases where they were sent away from the cities and from their families, most of those children um, wanted to return black back to their families after their indentures were complete. Um, sometimes they would get um, they were supposed to get an education during their indenture. They were supposed to get some form of um, compensation when they were done. And, and this could be um, books or clothes. It, it really varied and it was usually um, pretty minor um, what they received. And when they were done, um, like I said, those children wanted to return to their families. And sometimes this was a little bit difficult and they had to do the work of either finding their families, um, reuniting with their families, and then finding work um, once they were reunited. And then in other cases, if they were domestic, usually they were um, able to be with their families in um, better, or if they were in urban settings. Um, so they didn't necessarily have to return to their families, but um, often in those cases, they stayed on, um, especially as women. Um, black women in the North were often domestic throughout their lives um, and worked even after marriage while middle class women were not working um, by that point. And um, they often as black men transitioned to um, forms of manual labor, um, often in kind of dangerous conditions in urban centers of the North. And for my book, what I found for the children that I was looking at, because I was looking at a lot of records for specifically for children, they would really drop off. Um, and I'd have to look in different places to find out what happened to them. And I tell a story of one child, um, Henry, who was actually Stephen's brother, who was not indentured by the Philadelphia Shelter for Colored Orphans because his mom took him out before he was going to be indentured. And he ended up living with his mom, supporting her, um, working, and then um, serving in the Civil War and being with her throughout his entire life. So that was a really um, a nice story for me to tell for myself, a kind of different or a kind of alternate to what I found was happening to many of these children as they, as they grew up after their indentures. Thank you, thanks. Um... Jim is wondering if the restrictions for African-American children and the opportunities for them in the lower North, um, so Indiana, Southern Illinois, Southern Ohio, differ from the restrictions and opportunities in the upper North, including New England. Did the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 increase challenges for these children? Absolutely, great question. So, um... I think that the conditions were different also because I was looking at places where there were sizable populations of free African-Americans where they kind of had free black communities. Um, and these were concentrated mainly in New York, Philadelphia and Boston. That's why I chose to kind of look at those 
places. And because of that visibility, there were, I think, more kind of um, clear cut and defined um, restrictions and treatment of black children. So in other places, I had a few other places in the lower north kind of come in mainly later um, in my study as black people um, migrated to those regions. But for the kind of earlier period that I'm looking at, they're really concentrated in um, the cities at sizable numbers, which I, again, kind of increased their visibility. Um, some black children made their way into some of these places separated from black parents in the North by way of the orphan train. Um, and the orphan train movement is really fascinating at this period and, and um, uh, a kind of different history in and of itself. Um, but what I found is that there weren't um, large numbers of black, black children being transported on the orphan trains, that they were mainly being sent to these institutions in the North. Um, I think in a relationship to the fugitive slave um, law, which I talk about later in the book, because what ends up happening is we have black children who are in some ways, some of the most vulnerable during that time because they become vulnerable to kidnapping, um, as well as this kind of slippage, as I mentioned, between indenture and enslavement. So former enslavers sometimes instead of indenturing, um, black children would sell them into slavery in the South so that they could kind of get around the process of emancipation and in the context of, um, especially in the context of the fugitive slave law. And a really good example of that is Sojourner Truth's son who was sold south to Alabama. And she has to fight this legal battle to get him back. And it becomes quite complicated. Um, I think off in large reason because he is a child and for many of the same um, factors that I talked about in my talk, it's kind of black children are kind of seen as this um, almost like insignificant or anonymous or anomaly or a kind of um, a kind of necessary victim almost in the process of transitions to slavery and freedom. Um, and not to go too far outside of the scope of the project, but really related to Juneteenth, we also see this happening in the South as part of the process of emancipation. I write about this, I think in the blog that you shared earlier, but um, the same thing happens in the South. This, this way of um, emancipating the pop population, but still indenturing and apprenticing black children. So we see those really interesting parallels happening at both moments um, or at different moments, but in both regions of the North and South. Thank you, thanks. Um, Tom is wondering if any of the young um, Black orphans were introduced into families as playmates to white children. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then sort of a follow-up, wondering if that, you know, you mentioned the lightness of skin as a request, if that was perceived as some sort of indicator of proportion of white ancestry. Interesting. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I can't think of examples where people are explicitly saying for a playmate, but I do think that um, this question does get at age in an interesting way, um, that the younger ages, um, and the I think I'm thinking of the example I gave um, of children to bring up. I had, a, I had thought of that in the kind of orphan sense of um, we want children who we can raise to be, um, to be productive laborers. But I do think that there is a kind of um, other element to that, the children to bring up that might have something to do with the other children in the household. That's a really excellent question that I hadn't considered for those cases. I do have cases of, a few cases of those who are requesting children in that way. Um, other than that, I hadn't seen very many references to, to playing with other children in the household. And I think that that request for lighter skin um, definitely is a kind of 
request for a proximity to whiteness that is about how the family is perceived, right? Um, so at the time, very much like the South, a family kind of economic stature and even social stature um, would have very much to do with who's working in the house, um, what the servants look like, um, and um, having someone who is lighter skinned. At the same time, it's, it's a different kind of, it's not having a white indentured servant, but it's certainly having, yeah, a kind of proximity to whiteness that would be um, desirable for many Northern um, families in that way. But that's a really excellent question thinking about the children in the household that I hadn't thought about. So thank you for that. Thanks. Um, so Marjorie is wondering a little more about the comparison of childhood between poorer white children and black children, um, because at the beginning you were you were talking about rich to poor. Um, and uh, yes, so just just wondering about those um, uh, you know, rather than the economic differences. Yeah, absolutely. So we have very clear kind of indications of different treatment between black children and white. The main one, right, is enslavement. So during, while African-Americans are enslaved, they're considered property, right? So their, their children wouldn't be considered legally children. They'd be commodified and considered property. As they're emancipated, um, there are legal racial codes in the North that restrict black life um, specifically. And these are through the 19th century, specifically restrict voting rights, um, participation in um, courts, um, schooling, segregation, all these very clear legal indications that we have that really, again, kind of mirror what happens in the South um, in the Jim Crow era. So beyond those two areas, another way that I look at the kind of marginalization that's specific for black children um, is the indenture process. So there are institutions that have white children, orphanages, um, juvenile reformatories, and they are also indenturing those children. Those become the main place that white children are indentured while black children are indentured beyond those places, right? They're indentured just as part of the emancipation um, in the North. And the white children in these places, um, the indenturing really fades as the 19th century goes on and it, it doesn't for black children. And the other area is that the indenture of white children, they're primarily, I think I described this a little bit, but they're primarily serving skilled labor um, roles while black children are not. So in the same places where, so there are some, for example, some juvenile reformatories that have black and white children, but this becomes a racial distinction that the same place that's, institution, that's indenturing both might say that the white male child is going to be indentured to a blacksmith while the black male child is going to be a domestic laborer. And that, that also becomes a gender distinction as well. Um, so those are just a few areas of um, distinction between life for white children and black. Um, again, there are kind of um, economic forces behind that too. And there are other, um, other ethnic forces as well. A lot of the white children that are in these institutions are Irish immigrants. And that's a, a, a kind of, yeah, a, a kind of distinction between um, other white children, but Still at the same time, these Irish immigrants um, in a kind of racial hierarchy are getting treatment that's superior than even the black children in these spaces. Thank you, thanks very much. Elizabeth is wondering what the percentage of African-American children were indentured in the North versus those who were not and were actually free. Oh, that's a great question. So actually this, this there's not a very large distinction. Even the children who grow up to be um, 
And this is a great way of kind of getting at that racial difference too. Even children who grow up to be um, well-known figures in the North who come from middle-class or quote unquote middle-class black families were often indentured. So some of the um, figures that we associate with the abolitionist movement who were kind of born free um, were also indentured as part of their childhood. Um, again, because of this transition from slavery to freedom and this, the kind of culture of being a black child in the North. And as I said, that, that gets at that racial difference too, because while black children who are middle-class could be indentured, it would be very rare for a white middle-class child to have been indentured um, during this period and in this region. So that's, that's another important distinction. And I'm trying to think of um, some examples of this, but really, like I said, it, it just is, um, yeah, many of the figures that we associate with, uh, with the period ended up being also indentured as children and indentured while they're, while they're going to school. There's one important distinction that I'll make, a very interesting, um, interesting piece that I came across while doing this work was that there were African-Americans who were involved in the indenturing process and saw this as a kind of um, site of um, autonomy and agency. And one of these areas in New York was in the chimney sweep industry, which I found fascinating that there were a number of black managers of black children um, indentures in that industry. And they saw this as a kind of source of pride and again, as a kind of space that they had autonomy in. And then those children um, also grew up to be um, chimney sweep managers. So that's, a, that's one important distinction that I saw, but by and large, um, most, I'd say most children, unless they had um, very extreme circumstances, um, were probably indentured at some point or performing, certainly performing labor as children. All right. Well, we're getting short on time. I, I have just a couple more that I am going to ask, and then maybe we can follow up with a couple of people offline. But I thought Omer's um, question is interesting because we have talked a lot about the archive, and um, but but maybe a couple more specifics could be interesting. Um, the question is, I have an ancestor who is in the book Lost Children of West Tennessee, and the book contains only a list of names and the person she was indentured to. And I am looking for documentation. Where would you suggest I look? Her service was 1867. Oh, wow, that's, that's fabulous. That's great that they're in the book. Yeah, I've had a hope that some people might find um, inspiration or even relatives um, through naming the children. That's such an important part of my book. So I love that that book does the same, um, names these children and gives kind of historical significance to them. So I would say um, the, the places that I turn to even for my book um, and for myself are genealogical research sites, family search, ancestry that pull from different places. But even going to um, local archives and libraries and um, looking at some of the records that they have there. But if you're online for myself, the census records have been um, really important for the children that I'm looking at. And of course, as um, many folks know who do this kind of research, it's very similar. You kind of have to be creative with how you're looking, um, looking in unexpected places, looking for relatives, um, cousins, sisters, <laughs> that can kind of get at um, some of the answers. Um, but I, I love, like I said, I love the idea that, um, that people are finding um, ancestors are, are kind of looking through these records in those ways. Specifically for indenture, there are, I'm not sure for that, that region, but there are um, places that have indenture contracts and indenture records that could be useful for myself. Um, I actually didn't engage um, indenture records as much as I did um, advertisements for labor. And um, there, yeah, there are all sorts of different ways to get at this, um, even looking, if you have information about the person that they're indentured to. So that's, that's 
the Morris family is a great example of this, right? Um, looking through their records to get more information about a specific person that was there. Those are just a few suggestions. I, I would just add, in addition to the federal census, which is a gold mine, I, I don't know if Tennessee did a state census um, in this period, but a lot of states did. And so those records are not um, necessarily digitized as well, but um, they, they recorded different things. And so that can be really useful. Great, thanks. Um, so I thought I'd ask Jane's question. Can you talk more about how you explore play? I'm excited by the idea that play was radical and resisted the commodification of black children, but how do you know that play was joyful and not also work? Um, she's thinking about Rachel here. If she wasn't actually enjoying playing blinds man bluff, but felt compelled to as part of childcare, um, does that analysis still hold? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I love that question. Yeah, and that's um, essentially what I'm getting at, that, that play for Black children in these spaces was not just um, joyful. That's such a great um, addition to that analysis, that it was always kind of um, shadowed or darkened by this greater context. Um, but so the argument that I'm making essentially is just by being in that space um, while they're laborers um, challenged the commodification of their labor. So by basically by not laboring, um, and one could take it even further and say, um, anytime that they were not laboring, they're essentially kind of playing or enjoying or having an opportunity, making an opportunity um, to resist labor because they're always kind of seen as laborers. They don't have a clock in and clock out, um, and also that their age, their from their birth, according to these laws, from their birth until their adulthood, they are laborers. So, for me, that was so important to kind of find moments of resistance, and that one of those moments was was looking at um, Black children's play, which was also very fugitive in the archive itself. So, again, to find that. Um, that kind of representation challenged how they were represented in the archive also challenged how um, the adults around them were saying, well, they, they're only supposed to be here to be workers, that they're only supposed to be here to be educated and become appropriate members of society. So anytime they're not doing that, they're already kind of resisting that representation. Um, other ways that I looked at play, I looked at some toys and some, ways that play became racialized. Um, so toys primarily designed for white children that had very um, racial connotations or evoked a kind of racial play. Um, so I found some of these sources at the American Antiquarian Society during that uh, childhood seminar and really was inspired by thinking about how a white child was playing with an object could kind of elicit um, a certain response. And this I was really influenced by Robin Bernstein's racial innocence and kind of descriptive objects. Um, and then um, other ways I got at play was also just kind of thinking about um, the idea of um, childhood and how black children's non-adherence to that social construction, um, cultural construction was also a kind of play that Again, the ways that they're resisting their, their racialized childhood was, was a kind of play. So all these different, not strictly um, the kind of usual definitions that we have of play. Um, and I think that's part of what the book is trying to do is change even how we define play when at this time only children really, um, only certain children's play was protected and was encouraged, other children's was um, really um, seen as deviant or marginalized. Thank you, thanks. Um, thank you everybody for such wonderful questions and for uh, participating in this discussion. Professor Webster, this has been really wonderful. Thank you for joining us today on The Bookworm. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me and I hope you all have an enjoyable Juneteenth. Thank you so much, Crystal. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.